I think I was wrong about something that I was saying last year. I was pessimistic about the outlook of right to repair from a legal sense, not a cultural sense. I think in the cultural sense, more people, more average everyday people understand what right to repair is advocating for and understand why it's an important issue than ever before in my life. But the legal process, the part where you actually get a bill passed, that I had very low hopes for. One of the things that I've noticed is that when I show up at any of these legislatures, issues like immigration, abortion, gun rights, income inequality, taxation, uh, you know, health care, these are the hot button issues that people are arguing, that are trying to pass legislation regarding, that actually get people out to vote, that they can campaign on. Right to repair, not so much. Even when they actually do agree with it, when there's a legislative session, there's only so much that can be discussed, this just winds up at the bottom of the pile. This was pre-COVID. This year happens. You had the, the first impeachment trial, the uh, the, well, the lack of trial. You had the we had COVID, police brutality, police brutality protests, then riots, then anti-police brutality, then anti uh, anti-police brutality protester protests, COVID lockdowns, lockdown protests, destruction of the economy, and a bunch of people out of work. Uh, stimulus issues, an election, the election protesters, then the riots after the election protesters, then like this entire last 10 months has just been a nonstop roller coaster shit show. And one of the things that I was pessimistic about was that anybody would have their mind on right to repair after all this happened. Like, again, Lewis's ability to get access to an ISL 9239 is just not something that's on anybody's mind right now, I thought. And apparently, I couldn't have been further from the truth there for several reasons that I'll discuss in a minute. So um, this is a blog from Nathan Proctor. He works at the Public Interest Research Group. Per, uh, they, what they, they advocate for just basic public interest issues like this, as what it says in their name. And it shows you here that in addition to New Jersey, we have Delaware, Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland, Montana, Nebraska, Oklahoma, New Hampshire, New York, Oregon, South Carolina, Vermont, and Washington that have all filed new bills. So this is not slowing down. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first, I believe, is that people are realizing when they're forced to work from home and they're actually putting mileage on their own hardware that this stuff uh, does break and they do need it to work again. It's not like their IT department at work is dealing with their problems. Now they are their own IT department and fixing this stuff has to be done on their dime. Secondly, you've taken away most people's ability to make money. Because as Andrew Cuomo said, Brian, you want to go to work? work? Go take the job as an essential worker. Do it tomorrow. Right? You're working. You're an essential worker. So go take a job as an essential but, worker. But, but the people are hiring because of... The you know, you have people that are uh, are making it illegal for you to have a job. So now if your stuff breaks, if you are making $1,000 a week and your device broke, the decision as to whether to purchase a new one or fix it, eh. When you're making $0 a week, now that whole fix versus repair thing, that's going to be something that you notice a lot more than you did before. So this is an issue that is affecting people now more than ever because A, they need their personal electronic devices to work more than ever, and B, they have no money to buy a new one. There's not, a, you know, that, that three to four trillion dollars that got printed, that's not for you. And that that's a big part of what I think is driving people to care about this. And it's... People like Nathan Proctor do a lot of the work behind the scenes that doesn't get noticed. So when right to repair gets brought up, I always see my name get brought up. And it's kind of unfair because you have people that are doing all this work behind the scenes to ensure that these bills are actually introduced in all these states. The work that people like Nathan Proctor and the people at you know, US Perg are doing and their name is virtually never mentioned. He does, you know, again, they have their own ways of doing things. They focus on getting the actual bills introduced, getting them in front of politicians, the text of the bills. I focus on getting people, normal, average, everyday people to realize why this is a problem and uh, also f understand why this is a, an important cultural issue and get people, uh, you know, I've kind of tried to humanize the repair industry a bit with with my channel. We have different approaches, you know, he has the, um, he, he, he's got the suit and tie handshake approach, I have the scorched earth, this lobbyist is a moron approach. We have our different approaches to doing things, but I think it's important to recognize that the work that's being done and also understand what it is that you can do to actually contribute. So that the two most common questions that I get all the time are A, 
How do I know when these hearings are happening? B, what do I do? How do I answer that? Well, in Discord, we have a bot now, and I'll include a link to the Discord down below. There is a channel called Right to Repair Feed. And in Right to Repair Feed, there is a bot named after my kitty, who is now named after the stock, Blackberry. Uh, this, this bot over here will bring up every time a Right to Repair bill shows up in a particular area. And it will link you to that bill. So here you can see the bot will give you a link and the link will go here. So it'll give you the name of the bill. It'll tell you where it is. It'll tell you who the sponsors are. So you could reach out to that senator if you live in Nebraska and then say, hey, who do we need to, you know, what do we need to do to get this bill passed? Who needs to to be convinced? Who, who, who needs to be spoken to? Who needs to be lobbied? And then you can ask, and then you can show up in the offices of those individuals. You can email them. You can call them. You can let them know that this is important. This is a very important thing. Every time one of these bills gets introduced, the moment it's introduced, that's the point at which you want to hit the ground running and say, this is important to me. You want their phone to be ringing off the hook. You want their email to be, um, inbox to be full of people who live in that area. Me, as a New York voter, I do not matter to a Nebraska or a Kentucky or an Oklahoma politician. A Nebraska politician does not care what a New York voter thinks because the New York voter doesn't vote in a Nebraska election. They care about what people think in Nebraska. And we have links here every time this comes up so that you'll know when these are showing up. And you, you just navigate your way through. Speak to the individuals. Find their pages. Email them. Call them. And get involved. Once COVID is over with, then you can go back to doing what I used to do, which is actually showing up at the legislator and meeting people in person. Further, the second thing is, what do I say? Well, I've tried to put together a little bit of a template over here, that, and I will share it below. This has dated with the last hearing that I went to before uh, COVID came about and destroyed the ability for us to do this type of stuff in person. But this is a right to repair written testimony. Again, you can edit the name of the bill before you submit anything, edit the names of the bills, edit the name and address to be you. So here I discuss just about everything that I discuss in the channel. So if, you, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you understand the right to repair issues, you understand the BS lobbyist talking point arguments, most of this is, is pretty much included in here. And I also have it with citations. So at the bottom of the page, you can see this is, you know, I actually have the little numbers at the end of the sentences and the citations at the bottom and all that stuff to make it look all fancy schmancy. There's some case law that I included here in the bottom. And you're free to make it better, make it your own, edit it a little bit, you know. But this this is just a starting point so that you're not starting from scratch if you just don't have the time to do this. A lot of the times when you speak to your local politician, you can get them on board usually. It's, it's not about reading nine or ten pages of stuff. The reason this stuff is important is because the decisions are usually made before there's actually a legislative hearing. So when you see me show up at a legislative hearing, record it and testify at it, at that point, minds are already made up. They're not going to be, you know, changing the law one way or the other based on the hearing. They're going to be changing it based on what they hear prior to the hearing. So when the hearing shows up and the lobbyists show up and they repeat all the same BS, magtrometer, explode, blah, 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 that they usually do, the, you know, the, the, the game plays the console and all that other crap, they are going to hear all that stuff. But if you said, okay, here's what you're going to hear from the opposition lobbyist. Here's why we think it's disingenuous. Here are citations. And you give that to them two months before the hearing. There's a good chance that when that hearing shows up, that you get a considerably different response and a much more positive one. If you look at the Washington hearing, that went a lot differently than a lot of the hearings that I've been to. The, the senators there fully understood our points they understood the opposition to the lobbyist arguments. They understood why the lobbyist argument was garbage before we even got up there. So before we even had a chance to give our testimony, they were already skewering the lobbyists, which I found to be absolutely beautiful. And I suggest that you watch it. It should be somewhere in my channel from last year. I think it was January 20th or January 23rd there was, that video came out. And uh, yeah, th that's about it. So it looks like this is indeed going to be an active year. Uh, my bot did not point out to me that there was actually going to be a Zoom hearing in Maryland tomorrow. I apologize for that. I, I, I admittedly, I dropped the ball there to, for the fact that I was not. The deadline to submit testimony for the House bill in Maryland was actually yesterday, and it's going to be a Zoom hearing tomorrow. My apologies. I take responsibility. I dropped the ball entirely when it came to this. I can't testify or submit anything. But I will make an effort to, uh, to continue to, you know, 
just do what we do. You know, when testimony shows up from the opposition, I would like to film it whenever possible, make it available whenever possible, so that the act of lying to politicians to get them to vote against the will of the people is something that just happens less often. Or at the very least, if you're going to oppose right to repair, by all means, oppose it based on factual data rather than than crap. I spoke with someone um, on civil law, and I made what I thought would be the most genuine argument against right to repair if I was an opposition lobbyist, one that I could actually in some way, shape, or form respect because they're not just making things up about magtrometers exploding and all this other TikTok on the phone garbage that you hear from the lobbyist today. Uh, but yeah, that, that's about it. So I'll see you all later. If you want, you can join me in the Discord. Thank you to everybody who helped uh, proofread this right to repair written testimony for me last year. Thank you for everybody who's watching. And uh, as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.